Story One of Three Science Fiction Stories by Fritz Leiber. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Three SF Stories by Fritz Leiber. Story One Pipe Dream. This story was first published in Worlds of If Science Fiction, February 1959. It wasn't until the mermaid turned up in his bathtub that Simon Grew seriously began to wonder what the Russians were doing on the roof next door. The old house next door, together with its spacious tar-papered roof, which held a sort of pent shack, a cylindrical old water tank, and several chicken wire enclosures, had always been a focus of curiosity in this region of Greenwich Village, especially to whoever happened to be renting Simon's studio the north window cum skylight of which looked down upon it, if you were exceptionally tall, or if, like Simon, you stood halfway up a stepladder and peered. During the nineteen twenties old-timers told Simon the house had been owned by a bootlegger who had installed a costly pipe organ and used the water tank to store hooch. Later there had been a colony of shaven-headed Buddhist monks who had strolled about the roof in their orange and yellow robes, meditating and eating raw vegetables. There had followed a Commedia dell'arte theatrical group, a fencing salon, a school of the organ the bootlegger's organ was always one of the prime renting points of the house, an Arabian restaurant, several art schools and silver craft shops, of course, and an existentialist coffee house. The last occupants had been two bony-cheeked Swedish blondes who sunbathed interminably and had built the chicken wire enclosures to cage a large number of sinister smoke-colored dogs. Simon decided they were breeding werewolves, and one of his most successful abstractions, Grey Hunger, had been painted to the inspiration of an eldritch howling. The dogs and their owners had departed abruptly one night in a closed van, without any of the dogs ever having been offered for sale, or either of the girls having responded with anything more than a raised eyebrow to Simon's brave greenings of Skull. The Russians had taken possession about six months ago. Four brothers, apparently, and one sister, who never stirred from the house, but could occasionally be seen peering dreamily from a window. A white card with a boldly inked Stulinkov Gorovich had been thumbtacked to the peeling green-painted front door. Lovkario Smits, the interior decorator, told Simon that the newcomers were clearly white Russians. He could tell by their bushy beards. Lester Fliggums maintained that they were Red Russians, passing as white, and talked alarmingly of spying, sabotage, and suitcase bombs. Simon, who had the advantages of living on the spot and having been introduced to one of the brothers, Vlasi, at a neighboring art gallery, came to believe that they were both red and white and something more, solid, complete Slavs in any case double Dostoevsky Russians, if one may be permitted the expression. They ordered vodka, caviar, and soda crackers by the case. They argued interminably, loudly in Russian, softly in English. They went on mysterious silent errands. They gloomed about on the roof. They made melancholy music with their deep harmonious voices and several large guitars. Once, Simon thought they even had the bootlegger's organ going, but there had been a bad storm at the time, and he hadn't been sure. They were not quite as tight-lipped as the Swedish girls. Gradually a curt front sidewalk acquaintance developed, and Simon came to know their names. There was Blasi, of course, who wore thick glasses, the most scholarly-looking of the lot, and certainly the most bibulous. Simon came to think of Blasi as the vodka-breather. Occasionally he could be glimpsed holding Erlenmeyer flasks, trays of cultured dishes, and other pieces of biological equipment, or absent-mindedly wiping off a glass slide with his beard. Then there was Ivan, the dourest of the four, though none of them save Lossie seemed very amiable. Simon's private names for Ivan were the Nihilist and the Bomber, since he sometimes lugged about with him a heavy globular leather case. With it and his beard 
a square black one, he had more than once created a mild sensation in the narrow streets of the village. Next there was Mikhail, who wore a large crucifix on a silver chain around his neck and looked like a more spiritual Rasputin. However, Simon thought of him less as the religious than as the whistler, for his inveterate habit of whistling into his straggly beard a strange tune that obeyed no common harmonic laws. Sometimes Mikhail seemed to carry a chilly breeze around with him, a permanent cold draft, so that Simon had to check himself in order not to clutch together his coat collar whenever he heard the approach of the eerie piping. Finally there was Lev, beardless, shorter by several inches, and certainly the most elusive of the brothers. He always moved at a scurry, frequently dipping his head so that it was some time before Simon assured himself that he had the Stulinkov gurevich face. He did, unmistakably. Lev seemed to be away on trips a good deal. On his returns he was frequently accompanied by furtive but important-looking men, a different one on each occasion. There would be much bustle at such times, among other things the shades would be drawn. Then in a few hours Lev would be off again, and his man-about-town companion too. And of course there was the indoors-keeping sister. Several times Simon had heard one of the brothers calling Grushinka, so he assumed that was her name. She had the Stulnikov gurevich face, too, though on her, almost incredibly, it was strangely attractive. She never ventured on the roof, but she often sat in the pent shack. As far as Simon could make out, she always wore some dark Victorian costume. At least it had a high neck, long sleeves, and puffed shoulders. Pale-faced in the greenish gloom, she would stare for hours out of the pent shack's single window, though never in Simon's direction. Occasionally she would part and close her lips, but not exactly as if she were speaking, at least aloud. He thought of calling her the bubble-blower. The effect was as odd as Mikhail's whistling, but not as unpleasant. In fact, Simon found himself studying Grushinka for ridiculously long periods of time. His mild obsession began to irk him, and one day he decided henceforth to stay away altogether from his north window and the stepladder. As a result he saw little of the alterations the Russians began to make on the roof at this point, though he did notice that they lugged up, among other things, a length of large diameter transparent plastic piping. Go oh, much for the Russians, now for the mermaid. Late one night Simon started to fill his bathtub with cold water to soak his brushes and rags. He was working with a kind of calcimine at the time, experimenting with portable murals painted on large plaster-faced wooden panels. Heavily laden he got back to the bathroom just in time to shut off the water, and to see a tiny fish of some sort splashing around in it. He was not unduly surprised. Fish up to four or five inches in length were not unheard of apparitions in the cold water supply of the area, and this specimen looked as if it displaced no more than a teaspoon of water. He made a lucky grab, and the next moment he was holding in his firmly clenched right hand the bottom half of a slim, wriggling creature, hardly two inches long, and now Simon was surprised indeed. To begin with, it was not greenish-white, nor any common fish color, but palely pinkish, flesh-colored, in fact. And it didn't seem so much a fish as a tadpole. At least its visible half had a slightly oversized head, shaped like a bullet that was mushroomed a little, and two tiny writhing arms or appendages of some sort, and it felt as if it had rather large hips for a fish, or even a tadpole. Equip a two-month human embryo with a finny tail, give it in addition a precocious feminine sexiness, and you'd get something of the same effect. But all that was nothing. The trouble was that it had a face. A tiny face, of course, and rather goggly ghostly like a planarian's. But a face nevertheless, a human-looking face, and also here was the real trouble. 
a face that bore a grotesque but striking resemblance to that of Grushin Kostulikov Gurevich. Simon's fingers tightened convulsively. Simultaneously the slippery creature gave a desperate wriggle. It shot into the air in a high curve and fell into the scant inch of space between the bathtub and the wall. The next half-hour was hectic in a groveling sort of way. Retrieving anything from behind Simon's ancient claw-footed bathtub was a most difficult feat. There was barely space to get an arm under it, and at one point the warping of the floorboards prevented even that. Besides, there was the host of dust-shrouded objects it had previously been too much trouble to tease out. An accumulation of decades. At first Simon tried to guide himself by the faint flopping noises along the hidden base of the wall, but these soon ceased. Being on your knees and your chest with an ear against the floor and an arm strainingly outstretched is probably not the best position to assume while weird trains of thought go hooting through your head. But sometimes it has to happen that way. First came a remembered piece of neighborhood lore that supported the possibility of a connection between the house next door and the tiny pink aquatic creature now suffering minute agonies behind the bathtub. No one knew what ancient and probably larceny-minded amateur plumber was responsible. But the old-timers assured Simon there was a link between the water supply of the Russian's house with its aerial cistern and that of the building containing Simon's studio and several smaller apartments. At any rate, they maintained that there was a time during the period when the bootlegger was storing hooch in the water tank that several neighborhood coal-water taps were dispensing a weak but nonetheless authoritative mixture of bourbon and branch water. So thought Simon as he groped and strained. If the Russians were somehow responsible for this weird fishlet, there was no insuperable difficulty in understanding how it might have gotten here. But that was the least of Simon's preoccupations. He scrabbled wildly and unsuccessfully for several minutes, and then, realizing he would never get anywhere in this unsystematic manner, he began to remove the accumulated debris piece by piece. Dark cracked ends of soap, wash rags dried out in tortured attitudes, innumerable dark dyed cigarette stumps, several pocket magazines with bleached wrinkled pages, empty and near empty medicine bottles and pill vials, rusty hairpins, bobby pins, safety pins, crumpled toothpaste tubes, and a couple for oil paint, a gray toothbrush, a fifty-cent piece and several pennies, the mummy of a mouse, a letter from Picasso, and last of all, from the dark corner behind the bathtub's inside claw, the limp pitiful thing he was seeking. It was even tinier than he'd thought. He carefully washed the dust and flug off it, but it was clearly dead, and its resemblance to Grushenka Stulnikov Gorovich had become problematic. Indeed, Simon decided that someone seeing it now for the first time would think it a freak minnow or monstrous tadpole, and nothing more, though mutation or disease had obviously been at work. The illusion of a miniature mermaid still existed in the tapering tail and arm-like appendages, but it was faint. He tried to remember what he knew about salamanders. Almost nothing, it turned out. He thought of embryos, but his mind veered away from the subject. He wandered back into the studio, carrying the thing in his hand. He climbed the stepladder by the north window and studied the house next door. What windows he could see were dark. He got a very vague impression that the roof had changed. After he had strained his eyes for some time, he fancied he could see a faint path of greenish luminescence streaming between the pent shack and the water tank. But it was very faint indeed, and might only be his vision swimming. He climbed down the stepladder and stood for a moment, weighing the tiny dead thing in his hand. It occurred to him that one of his friends at the university could dig up a zoologist to pass on his find. But Simon's curiosity was more artistic than scientific. In the end he twisted a bit of cellophane around the thing, placed it on the ledge of his easel, and went off to bed. 
and to a series of disturbingly erotic dreams. Next day he got up late, and after breakfasting on black coffee, gloomed around the studio for a while, picking things up and putting them down. He glanced frequently at the stepladder, but resisted the temptation to climb up and have another look next door. Sighing, he thumb-tacked a sheet of paper to a drawing board and half-heartedly began blocking in a female figure. It was insipid and lifeless. Stabbing irritably at the heavy curve of the figure's hip, he broke his charcoal. "'Damn!' he said, glaring around the room. Abandoning all pretense, he threw the charcoal on the floor and climbed the stepladder. He pressed his nose against the glass. In daylight the adjoining roof looked bare and grimy. There was a big transparent pipe running between the water tank and the shack, braced in two places by improvised-looking wooden scaffolding. Listening intently, Simon thought he could hear a motor going in the shack. The water looked sallow green. It reminded Simon of those futuristic algae farms where the stuff is supposed to be pumped through the transparent pipes to expose it to sunlight. There seemed to be a transparent top on the water tank, too. It was too high for Simon to see, but there was a gleam around the edge. Staring at the pipe again, Simon got the impression there were little things traveling in the water, but he couldn't make them out. Climbing down in some excitement, Simon got the twist of cellophane from the ledge of the easel and stared at its contents. Wild thoughts were tumbling through his head as he got back up on the stepladder. Sunlight flashed on the greenish water pipe between the tank and the shack, but after the first glance he had no eyes for it. Grushenka Stulnikov Gurevich had her face tragically pressed to the window of the shack. She was wearing the black dress with high neck and puffed shoulders. At that moment she looked straight at him. She lifted her hands and seemed to speak imploringly. Then she slowly sank from sight, as if it horribly occurred to Simon into quicksand. Simon sprang from his chair, heart beating wildly, and ran down the stairs to the street. Two or three passers-by paused to study him as he alternately pounded the flaking green door of the Russian's house and leaned on the button. Also watching was the shirt-sleeved driver of a moving van, emblazoned Stulnikov Gurevich Enterprises, which almost filled the street in front of the house. The door opened narrowly. A man with a square black beard frowned out of it. He topped Simon by almost a head. Yes. Ivan the bomber asked, in a deep, exasperated voice. "'I must see the lady of the house immediately,' Simon cried. "'Your sister, I believe. She's in danger.' He surged forward. The butt of the bomber's right hand took him firmly in the chest, and he staggered back. The bomber said coldly, "'My sister is uh, taking a bath.' Simon cried, "'In that case she's drowning,' and surged forward again. But the bomber's hand stopped him short. "'I'll call the police!' Simon shouted, flailing his limbs. The hand at his chest suddenly stopped pushing and began to pull. Gripped by the front of his shirt, Simon felt himself being drawn rapidly inside. "'Let go! Help! A kidnapping!' he shouted to the inquisitive faces outside, before the door banged shut. "'No police!' rumbled the bomber, assisting Simon upstairs. Now look here, Simon protested futilely. In the two-story high living room to his right, the pipes of an organ gleamed golden from the shadows. At the second landing a disheveled figure met them, glasses twinkling, Vlasi the vodka breather. He spoke querulously in Russian to Ivan, who replied shortly. Then Vlasi turned and the three of them climbed up the narrow third flight to the pent shack. This housed a small, noisy machine perhaps an aerator of some sort, for bubbles were streaming into the transparent pipe where it was connected to the machine, and under the pipe, sitting with an idiot smile on a chair of red plush and gilt, was a pale, black-moustached man. An empty clear glass bottle with a red and gold label lay on the floor at his feet. The opposite side of the room was hidden by a heavy plastic shower curtain. Rushenka Stulnikov Gurevich was not in view. 
Ivan said something explosive, picking up the bottle and staring at it. Vodka, he went on. I have told you not to mix the pipe and the vodka. Now see what you have done. To me it seemed hospitable, said Vlasi with an apologetic gesture. Besides, only one bottle. Ducking under the pipe where it crossed the pent shack, Ivan picked up the pale man and dumped him crosswise in the chair, with his patent leather shoes sticking up on one side and his plump hands crossed over his chest. Let him sleep. First we must take down all the apparatus, before the capitalistic police arrive. Now, what to do with this one? He looked at Simon and clenched one large and hairy fist. Niet, 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 said the vodka breather, and went to whisper in Ivan's ear. They both stared at Simon, who felt uncomfortable, and began to back toward the door. But Ivan ducked agilely under the pipe and grasped him by the arm, pulling him effortlessly toward the roof exit. "'Just come this way, if you please, Mr. Gruyer," said Vlasi, hurrying after. As they left the shack he picked up a kitchen chair. Crossing the roof, Simon made a sudden effort and wrenched himself free. They caught him again at the edge of the roof, where he had run with nothing clearly in mind, but with his mouth open to yell. Suspended in the grip of the two Russians, with Ivan's meaty palm over his mouth, Simon had a momentary glimpse of the street below. A third bearded figure, Mikhail the Religious, was staring up at them from the sunny sidewalk. The melancholy face, the deep-socketed tormented eyes, and the narrow beard tangled with the dangling crucifix combined to give the effect of a Tolstoy novel's dust-jacket. As they hauled Simon away, he had the impression that a chilly breeze had sprung up, and the street had darkened. In his ears was Mikhail's distant, oddly discordant whistling. Grunting, the two brothers set Simon down on the kitchen chair, and slid him across the roof until something hard but resilient touched the top of his head. It was the plastic pipe through which, peering upward, he could see myriads of tiny polywog shapes flitting back and forth. "'Do us a kindness not to make noise,' said Ivan, removing his palm. "'My brother Vlasi will now explain.' He went away. Curiosity as much as shock kept Simon in his chair. Vlasi, bobbing his head and smiling, sat down tailor-fashion on the roof in front of him. First, I must tell you, Mr. Gruet, that I am specialist in biological sciences, here you see results of my most successful experiment." He withdrew a round, clear glass bottle from his pocket and unscrewed the top. "'Ah?' said Simon tentatively. "'Indeed, yes. In my researches, Mr. Gruet, I discovered a chemical which will inhibit growth at any level of embryonic development, producing a viable organism at that point. The basic effect of this chemical is always towards survival at whatever level of development, one cell, a blustula, a worm, a fish, a four-legger. This research, which Lysenko scoffed at when I told him of it, I had no trouble in keeping secret, though at the time I was working as the unhappy collaborator of the godless Soviets. But perhaps I am being too technical? Not at all, Simon assured him. Good. Vlasi said, with simple satisfaction, and gulped at his bottle. Meanwhile my brother Mikhail was a religious brother at a monastery near Mount Athos. My nihilist brother Ivan was in Central Europe, while my third brother Lev, who was of commercial talents, had preceded us to the New World, where we always felt it would some day be our destiny to join one another. With the aid of brother Ivan, I and my sister Grushinka escaped from Russia. We picked up Mikhail from his monastery and proceeded here, where Lev had become a capitalist business magnate. My brothers, Ivan especially, were interested in my research. He had a theory that we could eventually produce hosts of men in this way, whole armies and political parties, all nihilists and all of them Stulnikov Guriviches. I assured him that this was impossible, that I could not play Cadmus for free-swimming farms or one thing. We have the way to feed them in the aqueous medium. 
but to make fully developed mammals placental nourishment is necessary. That I cannot provide. Yet to please him I began with, pardon me, the egg of my sister. That was as good a beginning as any, and perhaps it intrigued my vanity. Ivan dreamed his dreams of nihilist Slunikov Gurevich humanity. It was harmless, as I told myself. Simon stared at him glassy-eyed. Something rather peculiar was beginning to happen inside his head, about an inch under the point where the cool water-filled plastic pipe pressed down on his scalp. Little ghostly images were darting, delightfully wispy little girl things, smiling down at him impudently, then flirting away with the quick motion of their mermaid tails. The sky had been growing steadily darker and now there came the growl of thunder. Against the purple-gray clouds Simon could barely make out the semi-transparent shapes of the polywogs in the pipe over his head, but the images inside his mind were growing clearer by the minute. "'Ah, we have a storm,' Vlasi observed as the thunder growled again. "'That reminds me of Mikhail, who was much influenced by our Finnish grandmother. He had the belief as a child that he could call up the winds by whistling for them. He even learned special wind musics from her. Later he became a Christian religious. There are great struggles in him. Mikhail objected to my researches when he heard I used the egg of my sister. He said we will produce millions of souls who are not baptized. I asked him how about the water they are in. He replied, this is not the same thing. These little swimmers will wriggle in hell eternally. This worried him greatly. We tried to tell him I had not used the egg of my sister, only the egg of a fish. But he did not believe this, because my sister changed greatly at the time. She no longer spoke. She put on my mother's bathing costume, we are a family people, and retired to the bathtub all day long. I accepted this, at least in the water, she is not violent. Mikhail said, See, her soul is now split into many unredeemed subsouls, one each for the little swimmers. There is a sympathy between them, a hypnotic vibration. So long as you keep them near her, in that tank on the roof, this will be. If they were gone from there, far from there, the sub-souls would reunite, and Grushinka's soul would be one again. He begged me to stop my research, to dump it in the sea, to scatter it away. But Lev and Ivan demanded I keep on. Yet Mikhail warned me that works of evil end in the whirlwind. I am torn and undecided. He gulped at his vodka. Thunder growled louder. Simon was thinking, dreamily, that if the soul of Grushenka Stulnikov Gurevich were split into thousands of subsouls, vibrating hypnotically in the nearby water tank, with at least one of them escaping as far as his bathtub, then it was no wonder if Grushenka had a strange attraction for him. But that is not yet the worst, Vlasi continued. The hypnotic vibrations of the free-swimming ones in their multitude turn out to have a stimulating effect on any male who is near. Their sub-minds induce dreams of the piquant sort. Lev says that to make money for the work we must sell these dreams to rich men. I protest, but to no avail. Lev is maddened for money. Now, besides selling the dreams, I find he plans to sell the creatures themselves. Sell them one by one, but keep enough to sell the dreams to. Oh, it is a madness. The darkness had become that of night. The thunder continued to growl, and now it seemed to Simon that it had music in it. Vision swam through his mind to its rhythm. Hordes of swimming pygmy souls, of unborn water babies, migrations of miniature mermaids. The pipe hanging between water tank and pent shack became in his imagination a giant umbilicus or a canal for a monstrous multiple birth. Sitting beneath it, helpless to move, he focused his attention with increasing pleasure on the active, supple, ever more human girl bodies that swam across his mind. Now more mermaid than tadpole, with bright smiling lips and eyes. 
long Lorelei hair trailing behind them, they darted and hovered caressingly. In their wide-cheeked oval faces, he discovered without shock, there was a transcendent resemblance to the features of Grushenka Stulnikov Gurevich, a younger, milk-skinned maiden of the steppes, with challenging eyes and fingers that brushed against him with delightful shocks. So it is for me the great problem, Flossie's distant voice continued. I see in my work only the pure research, the play of the mind. Lev sees money. Ivan sees dragon teeth, fodder for his political cannon. Mikhail sees unshriven souls. Grushenka sees, uh, who knows, madness. It is indeed one great problem. Thunder came again, crashingly this time. The door of the pent shack opened. Framed in it stood Ivan the bomber. Vlasi, he roared, do you know what that idiot is doing now? As the thunder of his voice trailed off together, Simon became aware at last of the identity of the other sound which had been growing in volume all the time. Simultaneously Vlasi struggled to his feet. The organ, he cried. Mikhail is playing the whirlwind music. We must stop him. Pausing only for a last pull at the bottle, he charged into the pent shack following Ivan. Wind was shaking the heavy pipe over Simon's head, tossing him back and forth in the chair. Looking with an effort toward the west, Simon saw the reason. A spinning black pencil of wind that was riding its way toward them in wreckage across the intervening roofs. The chair fell under him. Stumbling across the roof, he tugged futilely at the door to the pinch shack, then threw himself flat, clawing at the tar paper. There was a mounting roar. The top of the water tank went spinning off like a flying saucer. Momentarily, as if it were a giant syringe, the whirlwind dipped into the tank. Simon felt himself sliding across the roof, felt his legs lifting. He fetched up against the roof's low wall, and at that moment the wind let go of him and his legs touched tar paper again. Gaining his feet numbly, Simon staggered into the leaning pinch shack. The pale man was nowhere to be seen, the plush chair empty. The curtain at the other side of the room had fallen with its rods, revealing a bathtub more antique than Simon's. In the tub, under the window, sat Grushenka. The lightning flares showed her with her chin level with the water, her eyes placidly staring, her mouth opening and closing. Simon found himself putting his arms around the black-clad figure. With a straining effort he lifted her out of the tub, water sloshing all over his legs, and half carried, half slid with her down the stairs. He fetched up, panting and disheveled at the top landing, his attention riveted by the lightning-illuminated scene in the two-story high living room below. At the far end of it, a dark-robed figure crouched at the console of the mighty organ, like a giant bat at the base of the portico of a black and gold temple. In the center of the room Ivan was in the act of heaving above his head his globular leather case. Mikhail darted a look over his shoulder and sprang to one side. The projectile crashed against the organ. Mikhail picked himself up, tearing something from his neck. Ivan lunged forward with a roar. Mikhail crashed a fist against his jaw. The bomber went down and didn't come up. Mikhail unwrapped his crucifix from his fingers and resumed playing. With a wild cry, Simon heaved himself to his feet, stumbled over Grishinska's sodden garments, and pitched headlong down the stairs. When he came to, the house was empty, and the Stulnikov moving van was gone. At the front door he was met by a poker-faced young man who identified himself as a member of the FBI. Simon showed him the globular case Ivan had thrown at the organ. It proved to contain a bowling ball. The young gentleman listened to his story without changing expression, thanked him warmly, and shooed him out. The Stulnikov Gurevichs disappear for good, though not quite without a trace. Simon found this item in the next evening's paper, the first of many he accumulated yearningly in a scrapbook 
during the following months. Mermaid Rain a Hoax, Scientist Declares Milford, Pennsylvania The Mermaid Rain reported here has been declared a fraud by an eminent European biologist. Vlasi stulnikov gurevich formerly professor of genetics at Peer University, Latvia, passing through here on a cross-country trip, declared the miniature mermaids were albino tadpoles, probably scattered about as a hoax by schoolboys. The professor added, I would like to know where they got them, however. There is clear evidence of mutation due perhaps to fallout. Dr. Stilnikov directed his party in a brief but intense search for overlooked specimens. His charming silent sister, Grushenka Stulnikov, wearing a quaint Latvian swimming costume, explored the shallows of the Delaware. After collecting as many specimens as possible, the professor and his assistants continued their trip in their unusual camping car. Dr. Stulnikov intends to found a biological research center in the calm and tolerant atmosphere of the West Coast, he declared. End of Pipe Dream Story number two of three science fiction stories by Fritz Lieber. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. X Marks the Pedwalk. This story was published in April 1963 in Worlds of Tomorrow. X Marks the Pedwalk. Based in material in Chapter 7, First Clashes of the Wheeled and Footed Sex, of Volume Three of Berger's Monumental History of Traffic, published by the Foundation for Twenty-Second Century Studies. The raggedy little old lady with the big shopping bag was in the exact center of the crosswalk when she became aware of the big black car bearing down on her. Behind the thick bulletproof glass, its seven occupants had a misty look, like men in a diving bell. She saw there was no longer time to beat the car to either curb. Veering remorselessly, it would catch her in the gutter. Useless to attempt a feint and double back, such as any venturesome child executed a dozen times a day, her reflexes were too slow. Polite, vacuous laughter came from the car's loudspeaker over the engine's mounting roar. From her fellow pedestrians lining the curbs came a sigh of horror. The little old lady dipped into her shopping bag and came up with a big blue back automatic. She held it in both fists, riding the recoils like a rodeo cowboy on a bucking bronco. Aiming at the base of the windshield, just as the big game hunter aims at the vulnerable spine of a charging water buffalo over the horny armor of its lowered head, the little old lady squeezed off three shots before the car chewed her down. From the right-hand curb a young woman in a wheelchair shrieked an obscenity at the car's occupants. Smythe de Winter, the driver, wasn't happy. The little old lady's last shot had taken two members of his car pool. Bursting through the laminated glass, the steel-jacketed slug had traversed the neck of Phipps McKeith and buried itself in the skull of Harvindyle Harker. Breaking viciously, Smythe the winter rammed the car over the right-hand curb. Pedestrians scattered into entries and narrow arcades, among them a youth bounding high on crutches. But Smythe the winter got the girl in the wheelchair. Then he drove rapidly out of the slum ring into the suburbs, a shred of rattan swinging from the flange of his right fore mudguard for a trophy. Despite the two-for-two two casualty list, he felt angry and depressed. The secure, predictable world around him seemed to be crumbling. While his companions softly keened a dirge to Harvey and Phipps and quietly mopped up their blood, he frowned and shook his head. "'They oughtn't to let old ladies carry magnums,' he murmured. Witherspoon Hobbs nodded agreement across the front-seat corpse. "'They oughtn't to let em carry anything. God, how I hate feet!' he muttered looking down at his shrunken legs. "'Wheels forever!' he softly cheered. The incident had immediate repercussions throughout the city. At the combined wake of the little old lady and the girl in the wheelchair, 
a fiery tongue speaker inveighed against the white-walled fascists of suburbia, telling to his hearers the fabled wonders of old Los Angeles, where pedestrians were sacrosanct even outside crosswalks. He called for a hobnail march across the nearest lawn bowling alleys and perambulator traversed golf courses of the motorists. At the Sunnyside crematorium, to which the bodies of Phipps and Harvey had been conveyed, an equally impassioned and rather more grammatical orator reminded his listeners of the legendary justice of old Chicago, where pedestrians were forbidden to carry small arms, and anyone with one foot off the sidewalk was fair prey. He broadly hinted that a holocaust, primed if necessary, with a few tankfuls of gasoline, was the only cure for the slums. Bands of skinny youths came loping at dusk out of the slum ring into the innermost sections of the larger doughnut of the suburbs, slashing defenseless tires, shooting expensive watchdogs and scrawling filthy words on the pristine panels of matrons' runabouts, which never ventured more than six blocks from home. Simultaneously, squadrons of young suburban motorcycles and scooterites roared through the outermost precincts of the slum ring, harrying children off sidewalks, tossing stink bombs through second-story tenement windows, and defacing hovel fronts with sprays of black paint. Incident. A thrown brick, a cut corner, monster tacks in the portico of the auto club, were even reported from the center of the city, traditionally neutral territory. The government hurriedly acted, suspending all traffic between the center and the suburbs, and establishing a twenty-four-hour curfew in the slum ring. Government agents moved only by centipede car and pogo hopper to underline the point that they favored neither contending side. The day of enforced non-movement for feet and wheels was spent in furtive, vengeful preparations. Behind locked garage doors, machine guns that fired through the nose ornament were mounted under hoods. Illegal scythe blades were welded to oversized hubcaps, and the stainless steel edges of flange fenders were honed to razor sharpness. While nervous National Guardsmen hopped about the deserted sidewalks of the slum ring, grim-faced men and women wearing black armbands moved through the webwork of secret tunnels and hidden doors, distributing heavy-caliber small arms and spike-studded paving blocks, piling cobblestones on strategic rooftops, and sapping upward from the secret tunnels to create car traps. Children got ready to soap intersections after dark. The Committee of Pedestrian Safety, sometimes known as Robespierre's Rats, prepared to release its two carefully hoarded anti-tank guns. At nightfall, under the tireless urging of the government, representatives of the pedestrians and the motorists met on a huge safety island at the boundary of the slum ring and the suburbs. Underlings began a noisy dispute as to whether Smith de Winter had failed to give a courtesy honk before charging, whether the little old lady had opened fire before the car had come within honking distance, how many wheels of Smith de's car had been on the sidewalk when he hit the girl in the wheelchair, and so on. After a little while, the high pedestrian and chief motorist exchanged cautious winks and drew aside. The red writhing of a hundred kerosene flares and the mystic yellow pulsing of a thousand firefly lamps mounted on yellow sawhorses ranged around the safety island illuminated two tragic, strained faces. A word before we get down to business, the chief motorist whispered. What's the current SQ of your adults? Forty-one and dropping, the high pedestrian replied, his eyes fearfully searching from side to side for eavesdroppers. I can hardly get aides who are halfway compost mentis. Our own sanity quotient is thirty-seven, the chief motorist revealed. He shrugged helplessly. The wheels inside my people's heads are slowing down. I do not think they will be speeded up in my lifetime. They say the government's only fifty-two, the other said with a matching shrug. Well, I suppose we must scrape out one more compromise, the one suggested hollowly though I must confess there are times when I think we're all the figments of a paranoid dream. Two hours of concentrated deliberations produced the new wheel-foot articles of agreement. Among other points, pedestrian handguns were limited to a slightly lower muzzle velocity and to thirty-eight caliber and under, 
while motorists were required to give three honks at one block distance before charging a pedestrian in a crosswalk. Two wheels over the curb change a traffic kill from third-degree manslaughter to petty homicide. Blind pedestrians were permitted to carry hand grenades. Immediately the government went to work. The new wheel-foot articles were loud-speakered and posted. Detachments of police and psychiatric social hoppers sent peddled and pogoed through the slum ring, seizing outsized weapons and giving tranquilizing jet injections to the unruly. Teams of hypnotherapists and mechanics scuttled from home to home in the suburbs and from garage to garage, enchanting a conformist serenity and stripping illegal armaments from cars. On the advice of a rogue psychiatrist who said it would channel off aggressions, a display of bullfighting was announced, but this had to be cancelled when a strong protest was lodged by the Decency League, which had a large mixed wheel-foot membership. At dawn, curfew was lifted in the slum ring and traffic reopened between the suburbs and the center. After a few uneasy moments it became apparent that the status quo had been restored. Smythe de Winter tooled his gleaming black machine along the ring. A thick steel bolt with a large steel washer on either side neatly filled the hole a little old lady slug had made in the windshield. A brick bounced off the roof. Bullets pattered against the side windows. Smythe de Winter ran a handkerchief around his neck under his collar and smiled. A block ahead, children were darting into the street, catcalling and thumbing their noses. Behind one of them limped a fat dog with a spiked collar. Smythe de Winter suddenly gunned his motor. He didn't hit any of the children, but he got the dog. A flashing light on the dash showed him the right front tire was losing pressure. Must have hit the collar as well. He thumbed the matching emergency air button and the flashing stopped. He turned toward Witherspoon Hobbs and said with thoughtful satisfaction, I like a normal, orderly world where you could always have a little success, but not champagne, Hetty. A little failure, but just enough to brace you. Witherspoon Hobbs was squinting at the next crosswalk. Its center was discolored by a brownish stain ribbon tracked by tires. That's where you bagged the little old lady, mister, he remarked. I'll say this for her. Now she had spirit. Yes, that's where I bagged her. Smythe agreed flatly. He remembered wistfully the witch-like face growing rapidly larger, her jerking shoulders in black bombazine, the wild white-circled eyes. He suddenly found himself feeling that this was a very dull day. End of X Marks the Pedwalk Story 3 of Three Science Fiction Stories by Fritz Sleiber this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Later Than You Think This story was first published in Galaxy Science Fiction, October 1950. Obviously the archaeologist's study belonged to an era vastly distant from today. Familiar similarities here and there only sharpened the feeling of alienage. The sunlight that filtered through the windows in the ceiling had a wan and greenish cast and was augmented by radiation from some luminous material impregnating the walls and floor. Even the wide desk and the commodious hassocks glowed with a restful light. Across the former were scattered metal-backed wax tablets, styluses, and a pair of large and oddly formed spectacles. The crammed bookcases were not particularly unusual, but the books were bound in metal, and the script on their spines would have been utterly unfamiliar to the most erudite of modern linguists. One of the books, lying open on a hassock, showed leaves of a thin, flexible, rustless metal covered with luminous characters. Between the bookcases were phosphorescent oil paintings, mainly of sea bottoms in somber greens and browns. Their style, neither wholly realistic nor abstract, would have baffled the historian of art. A blackboard with large colored crayons hinted equally at the schoolroom and the studio. In the center of the room, midway to the ceiling, 
hung a fish with iridescent scales of breathtaking beauty. So invisible was its means of support that, also taking into account the strange paintings and the greenish light, one would have sworn that the object was to create an underwater scene. The explorer made his interest in a theatrical swirl of movement. He embraced the archaeologist with a warmth calculated to startle that crusty old fellow. Then he settled himself on a hassock, looked up and asked a question in a speech and idiom so different from any we know that it must be called another means of communication rather than another language. The import was, Well, what about it? If the archaeologist was taken aback, he concealed it. His expression showed only pleasure at being reunited with a long-absent friend. "'What about what?' he queried. "'About your discovery.' "'What discovery?' The archaeologist's incomprehension was playful. The explorer threw up his arms. "'Why, what else but your discovery here on earth of the remains of an intelligent species? It's the find of the age. Am I going to have to coax you? Out with it.' I didn't make the discovery," the other said tranquilly. I only supervised the excavations and directed the correlation of materials. You ought to be doing the talking. You're the one who's just returned from the stars. Forget that," the explorer brushed the question aside. As soon as our spaceship got within radio range of Earth, they started to send us a continuous newscast covering the period of our absence. One of the items, exasperatingly brief, mentioned your discovery. It captured my imagination. I couldn't wait to hear the details." He paused, then confessed. "'You get so eager out there in space. A metal-filmed droplet of life lost in immensity. You rediscover your emotions.' He changed color, and then finished rapidly. As soon as I could get decently away, I came straight to you. I wanted to hear about it from the best authority, yourself." The archaeologist regarded him quizzically. "'I'm pleased that you should think of me and my work, and I'm very happy to see you again. But admit it now. Isn't there something a bit odd about your getting so worked up over this thing? I can understand that after your long absence from Earth any news of Earth would seem especially important. But isn't there an additional reason?" The explorer twisted impatiently. "'Oh, I suppose there is. Disappointment, for one thing. We were hoping to get in touch with intelligent life out there. We were specially trained in techniques for establishing mental contact with alien intelligent life-forms. Well, we found some planets with life on them, all right. But it was primitive life, not worth bothering about." Again he hesitated embarrassedly. Out there you get to thinking of the preciousness of intelligence. There's so little of it, and it's so lonely. And we so greatly need intercourse with another intelligent species to give depth and balance to our thoughts. I suppose I set too much store by my hopes of establishing a contact. He paused. At any rate, when I heard that what we were looking for you had found here at home, even though dead and done for. I felt that at least it was something. I was suddenly very eager. It is odd, I know, to get so worked up about an extinct species, as if my interest could mean anything to them now, but that's the way it hit me." Several small shadows crossed the windows overhead. They might have been birds, except they moved too slowly. "'I think I understand,' the archaeologist said softly. So get on with it and tell me about your discovery," the explorer exploded. <laughs> I've already told you that it wasn't my discovery," the archaeologist reminded him. A few years after your expedition left there was begun a detailed resurvey of Earth's mineral resources. In the course of some deep continental borings, one party discovered a cache, either a very large box or rather small room, with metallic walls of great strength and toughness. Evidently its makers had intended it for the very purpose of carrying a message down through the ages. It proved to contain artifacts, models of buildings, vehicles and machines, objects of art, pictures and books, 
hundreds of books, along with elaborate pictorial dictionaries for interpreting them. So now we even understand their languages. Languages? interrupted the explorer. That's queer. Somehow one thinks of an alien species as having just one language. Like our own, this species had several, though there were some words and symbols that were alike in all their languages. These words and symbols seem to have come down unchanged from their most distant prehistory. The explorer burst out. I'm not interested in all that dry stuff. Give me the wet. What were they like? How did they live? What did they create? What did they want? The archaeologist gently waved aside the questions. All in good time. If I am to tell you everything you want to know, I must tell it in my own way. Now that you are back on earth, you will have to reacquire those orderly and composed habits of thought which you have partly lost in the course of your wild interstellar adventures. Curse you, I think you're just trying to tantalize me. The archaeologist's expression showed that this was not altogether untrue. He casually fondled an animal that had wriggled up onto his desk, and which looked rather more like an eel than a snake. Cute little brute, isn't it? he remarked. When it became apparent that the explorer wasn't to be provoked into another outburst, he continued, it became my task to interpret the contents of the cache, to reconstruct its makers, climb from animalism and savagery to civilization, their rather rapid spread across the world's surface, their first fumbling attempts to escape from the earth. They had spaceships? It's barely possible. I rather hope they did since it would mean the chance of a survival elsewhere, though the negative results of your expedition rather lessen that." He went on. The cache was laid down when they were first attempting space flight, just after their discovery of atomic power, in the first flush of their youth. It was probably created in a kind of exuberant fancifulness, with no serious belief that it would ever serve the purpose for which it was intended. He looked at the explorer strangely. If I am not mistaken, we have laid down similar caches. After a moment the archaeologist continued, My reconstruction of their history, subsequent to the laying down of the cache, has been largely hypothetical. I can only guess at the reasons for their decline and fall. Supplementary material has been very slow in coming in, though we are still making extensive excavations at widely separated points. Here are the last reports." He tossed the explorer a small metal-leaf pamphlet. It flew with a curiously slow motion. "'That's what struck me so queer right from the start,' the explorer observed, putting the pamphlet aside after a glance. "'If these creatures were relatively advanced, why haven't we learned about them before? They must have left so many things—buildings, machines, engineering projects, some of them on a large scale. You'd think we'd be turning up traces everywhere." "'I have four answers to that,' the archaeologist replied. The first is the most obvious. Time. Geologic ages of it. The second is more subtle. What if we should have been looking in the wrong place? I mean, what if the creatures occupied a very different portion of the earth than our own? Third, it's possible that atomic energy, out of control, finished the race and destroyed its traces. The present distribution of radioactive compounds throughout the earth's surface lends some support to this theory. Fourth, he went on, it's my belief that when an intelligent species begins to retrogress, it tends to destroy, or rather, debase all the things it has laboriously created. Large buildings are torn down to make smaller ones. Machines are broken up and worked into primitive tools and weapons. There is a kind of unraveling or erasing. A cultural second law of thermodynamics begins to operate, whereby the intellect and all its works are gradually degraded to the lowest level of meaning and creativity. But why? The explorer sounded anguished. Why should any intelligent species end like that? <laughs> I grant the possibility of atomic power getting out of hand, though one would have thought they'd have taken the greatest precautions. 
Still, it could happen. But that fourth answer, it's morbid. Cultures and civilizations die, said the archaeologist evenly. That has happened repeatedly in our own history. Why not species? An individual dies, and is there anything intrinsically more terrible in the death of a species than in the death of an individual? He paused. With respect to the members of this one species, I think that a certain temperamental instability hastened their end. Their appetites and emotions were not sufficiently subordinated to their understanding and to their sense of drama, their enjoyment of the comedy and tragedy of existence. They were impatient and easily incapacitated by frustration. They seemed to have been singularly guilty in their pleasures, behaving either like gloomy moralists or gluttons. Because of taboos and an overgrown possessiveness, he continued, each individual tended to limit his affection to a tiny family. In many cases he focused his love on himself alone. They set great store by personal prestige, by the amassing of wealth and the exercise of power. Their notable capacity for thought and manipulative activity was expended on things rather than persons or feelings. Their technology outstripped their psychology. They skimped fatally when it came to hard thinking about the purpose of life and intellectual activity and the means for preserving them. Again the slow shadows drifted overhead. And finally, the archaeologist said, they were a strangely haunted species. They seemed to have been obsessed by the notion that others, greater than themselves, had prospered before them and then died, leaving them to rebuild a civilization from ruins. It was from those others that they thought they derived the few words and symbols common to all their languages. Gods? mused the explorer. The archaeologist shrugged. Who knows? The explorer turned away. His excitement had visibly evaporated, leaving behind a cold and miserable residue of feeling. I am not sure I want to hear much more about them, he said. They sound too much like us. Perhaps it was a mistake, my coming here. Pardon me, old friend, but out there in space even our emotions become undisciplined. Everything becomes indescribably poignant. Moods are tempestuous. You shift in an instant from zenith to nadir. And remember, out there you can see both. I was very eager to hear about this lost species, he added in a sad voice. I thought I would feel a kind of fellowship with them across the eons. Instead I touch only corpses. It reminds me of when, out in space, there looms up before your prow, faint in the starlight, a dead sun. They were a young race. They thought they were getting somewhere. They promised themselves an eternity of effort. And all the while there was wriggling toward them out of that future for which they yearned. Oh, it's so completely futile and unfair. I disagree, the archaeologist said spiritedly. Really, your absence from Earth has unsettled you even more than I first surmised. Look at the matter squarely. Death comes to everything in the end. Our past is strewn with our dead. That species died, it's true. But what they achieved, they achieved. What happiness they had, they had. What they did in their short span is as significant as what they might have done had they lived a billion years. The present is always more important than the future, and no creature can have all the future. It must be shared, left to others. Maybe so, the explorer said slowly. Yes, I guess you're right. But I still feel a horrible wistfulness about them, and I hug to myself the hope that a few of them escaped and set up a colony on some planet we haven't yet visited. There was a long silence. Then the explorer turned back. You old devil, he said, in a manner that showed his gayer and more boisterous mood had returned, though diminished. You still haven't told me anything definite about them. So I haven't, replied the archaeologist with guileful innocence. Well, they were vertebrates. 
Oh? Yes, and what's more, they were mammals. Mammals? I was expecting something different. I thought you were. The explorer shifted. All this matter of evolutionary categories is pretty cut and dried. Even a knowledge of how they looked doesn't mean much. I'd like to approach them in a more intimate way. How did they think of themselves? What did they call themselves? I know the word won't mean anything to me, but it will give me a feeling of uh, recognition. I can't say the word, the archaeologist told him, because I haven't the proper vocal equipment. But I know enough of their script to be able to write it for you as they would have written it. Incidentally, it is one of those words common to all their languages that they attributed to an earlier race of beings. The archaeologist extended one of his eight tentacles toward the blackboard. The suckers at its tip firmly grasped a bit of orange crayon. Another of his tentacles took up the spectacles and adjusted them over his three-inch protruding pupils. The eel-like glittering pet drifted back into the room and nosed curiously about the crayon as it traced R. A. T. Rat End of Later Than You Think End of Three Science Fiction Stories by Fritz Leiber these stories recorded by Phil Chenevere, October 2021, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana.